please give a warm welcome to Star Parker. Thank you. I sat next to Gary and his lovely wife last night at dinner and he kept saying, so what exactly do you want me to tell them about you? And I said, not the things you know, because <laughs> in this new world of the internet, everything you say can and will be used against you. Misquoted first and then going into the court of public opinion on the internet and go viral. I said, but you can mention that I'm a grandma, that's okay. People think that I'm a lot uh, younger than I am, but I appreciate that he stuck to the bio. I also appreciate Steamboat Institute. This is incredible. This is my first time here at the conference. It's my first time in this lovely area. Uh, who, I forgot, I think it was with Darren, yesterday going up the, I'm not even gonna try to say it, the little ride we took up the mountain. <laughs> I forgot how many times I said, okay, where, how does this work again? Uh, and then watching that, and preparing myself through the whole dinner that you were going down that way <laughs> because the alternative is that little dirty road that you see winding around in some I don't know what kind of Jeep would perhaps get us down so I was with a lovely family on our way down whose son happens to be in the youth ministry so I thought Lord we need a lot of youth ministry going on in this country today so I'm sure his call has just begun so we will make it to the other side we did and I'm pleased that we did so that I could also participate this morning and hear an incredible presentation about the crisis in our healthcare system and specific answers. But the challenge I've had over the last couple of days is through every presentation I've heard, including the one this morning, and I guess what has been worn in me for the last 25 years that I've been in public life, trying to do everything I can to dismantle the welfare state, the challenge is I sat there thinking, and almost half the country doesn't agree. Everything that we're representing here in this conference and all that has been said, and even when we use terms like the American people, half don't agree. And in fact, I think, and I've said many times, that we're at a critical cross point in this country, right now today, similar to in the 1850s, to where we can't go on like this anymore. And in fact, we are where Abraham Lincoln had to look into the scriptures and read the red words, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and say, a house divided against itself can't stand. He looked up and did not expect the union to dissolve, but he knew that we could no longer be half free and half slave. He knew that we were going to be all one or all the other. And the question before us right now as a nation, and one of the reasons I'm so honored that Steamboat and others all across this country are starting to reach in to get information out is that we could no longer go on like this. As a nation, we're going to have to make a decision right now, this election and the one to come, if we are going to be biblical and free or if we're going to be secular and socialist because we can no longer be both. As I've already said, I've been involved in public life for 25 years and many who know my story know that as a young woman, I spent years on welfare. And in fact, I describe it as believing the lie of the left. Oh, I believe their lie that we hear today, that the poor are poor because the wealthy are wealthy. I heard the lie that my problems were somebody else's fault. I heard the lie all my young life that America was so inherently racist that I did not need to mainstream. And I began very early in all types of ill and reckless behaviors from criminal activity to drug activity to sexual activity. I have been in and out of abortion clinic after clinic in this country of ours, those so-called safe, legal, rare environments that we allow one to go in whole and develop and out health in their womb and leaving out the back door empty. It wasn't until after the fourth time that I went into one of these so-called safe, legal, rare clinics that I had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there must be something wrong with killing your offspring. Perhaps the feminists don't have this one right. And I didn't change any of my behaviors at that time because I was still indoctrinated by the lie of the left and I began this journey after now being pregnant yet again, yet still not married, to live in the welfare state permanently. Because up until that time, that was how 
my existence was. That's how I paid for my abortions. That's how I paid for my reckless living. Seven years in and out, three and a half years consistently watching my life go into a little dark hole. And it wasn't until after a Christian conversion that I changed my life. You know, I know that a lot of people want to deny the significant role of a born-again experience and the place that it perhaps even plays in public policy. But I can attest to people can hear a little bit of information and change their life. And I did. I then began this journey into a biblical worldview, went to college, got a degree in marketing and international business, and then started one. Because I figured if, I, man, if I'm going to sell for somebody else, I could sell for myself and went into business. And after the 1992 Los Angeles riots destroyed my business, I began this journey into social policy reform. I started my current organization, CURE. It was then a coalition on urban renewal and education because we were a very activist organization. In fact, Sally Pipes came to one of our conferences one time and I was just sharing with Jennifer that she drove up and wondered why there were so many people at the parking lot because she was trying to get into my conference where she thought maybe there were going to be 30 people and then realized once she got inside that the parking lot was full of the people that were attending because there were 300 black pastors from all across this country who had come to hear our seminar session similar to this right after we passed Welfare Reform. And the name of the conference was Life After Welfare, What You Gonna Do Now? And they didn't know and they wanted to hear. I launched the work of CURE, which is a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. I moved it a few years ago, about eight years ago now, to Washington, D.C., full time from Los Angeles. And I still live in Southern California. A lot of people think that's a long commute from uh, um, Orange County to you know, that place. But um, <laughs> I think that those folks have never been on the 405 or the 5 freeway in Southern California because actually it's a very easy commute. And for all of the jokes I hear about the left coast and some telling me that I moved from Sodom to Gomorrah, I have to remind them that at least in Sodom, if California is Sodom and DC is Gomorrah, we're pissing away our own money. <laughs> but I launched a work of cure because I had knew firsthand the liberal promises of entitlement that were sold into our minority communities and how they caused generations to be pathologically dependent on government, centralized planning, and these welfare programs. I knew firsthand the rules of welfare. Don't work, don't save, don't get married, and we'll keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. And I knew the damage that these philosophies had done in the communities that matter most to me because it's my community. I concluded, like many Americans, that we needed people in Washington, D.C. who believed and would consistently fight for traditional values, limited government, free markets, and a strong national allegiance and defense. Traditional values because choice loses its meaning if it doesn't matter what we choose. Limited government because the role of government is to protect our property and our individual pursuits, not to plunder them, not to exploit us. Free markets because profit is good. In fact, profit is moral because it's the engine for tomorrow so that we can create the very jobs that our country is starving for so that we can get our economy back on track and a strong national allegiance and defense. I'll be, my life story embodies American exceptionalism. Oh, for those that don't know all of the details, and the morning will not allow me to tell you, I do have my book available here that talks a little bit about it. But years ago, I also penned my autobiography just to give you a glimpse inside of the life I left. It was called Pimps, Whores, and Welfare Brats. And I can guarantee you I left a lot of details out because I was not sure about statutes of limitations, and by then I was born again and did not want to spend the rest of my life in jail. And in fact, I did a lot of that activity in New Jersey, so every time I creep through, I'm thinking, I hope that the DNA thing doesn't catch up with me now. <laughs> My life story that anyone from any background, any ethnicity, even those that need a fresh starter to be born again, this is the country that that happens in. This is where we realize our dreams. <laughs> but today, every one of these founding principles are under attack. I'm the progressives keep telling Republicans that they lose national elections because of their conservative brand. Oh, they tell us that if conservatives would just act like liberals, 
then maybe, just maybe, young people and women people and black people and short people and some even illegal people might start to like them. No, they say that we need to get with their program. Rap a little, smoke pot a little, take off your clothes in front of total strangers a little, give up your guns, give up your God, give up your disapproval of gays, and of course you can only put up really liberal Republicans for your statewide seats or your national seats. And then maybe, just maybe, the national comedians will stop mocking you and the national news will just ignore you instead of try to destroy you or the lies of the left. And they didn't just start lying in 2008. They didn't just start lying when this Barack Obama administration turned up the, the fire on the stove, on this pot that was already slowly burning and the water was getting ready to boil. And in fact, I was glad when the Tea Party showed up. And I think, frankly, that the Barack Obama administration is the best thing that could have happened to this country because we were sleeping and we were slowly existing. And we were like that frog in the kettle that would have ended up dead until they turned that fire up. And people from all over the country, the decent people in quiet communities that were taking the elective process and the foundational documents for granted, dusted off the shelves and came to Washington, D.C. and said, we are taxed enough already and the party is over. And that party is over. And now we are gonna energize ourselves to not just put out little fires as we've been doing for the last at least 25 years I've been engaged and many before, but we're gonna take away the matches. The lie of the left, the lie that even all of us Republicans agree on all of the things I just mentioned is a lie of the left. And in fact, we are the party of diversity. We are the only ones that are having deep discussions about issues that matter and are willing to duke it out during primaries. I'm one that thinks that, okay, primaries are over, Thanksgiving Day is coming. And election day, we were pulling together. Yeah, we know you're one sleeping on the couch and we're really in divorce court fighting over the house, but company's coming, media's coming, and the Senate is up for grabs. You know, one of the serious lies, more serious, I suppose I should say, because these are very serious lies that they've passed out on us, and, but one far-reaching is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. The lie that they started 50 years ago in order to gain power and completely transform America into a secular socialist state, liberals began to build a political base by convincing blacks and other low-wage workers that redistribution of wealth was in the interest of social justice. Now, I'm going to define social justice as I do often because it sounds kind of cute these days, especially with our youth. I'm on college campuses. I've been in over 150, 190 now college campuses in the last 20 years across our country. I've been to every state in the union and frankly I almost did a book, 10 Reasons Not to Send Your Kid to a Secular College Unless You Want an Agnostic to Return Home. But when we started the comparisons between the secular schools and the religious schools, there were very few differences so we kind of put that on the shelf for a while, give the um, Christian community the opportunity to redeem themselves and start educating according to scripture and constitutional matters. But they've taught our children about social justice, and it almost sounds like a good idea, and after two years that they've been sitting in these cesspools we call schools, they come back and start challenging the worldview that has built this country. You've heard the definition, but I'm gonna read it. The great equalizer, to level the playing field between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor, the privileged and the underclass. And now some are even going as far as to say out loud, to take from the sons the of the former slaves, oh, enslavers, to take from the sons of the former enslavers and give to the sons of the formerly enslaved. Liberals always pretend that they're against war, but in their quest for power, they started three wars against our American culture, and if Republicans do not start taking these wars head on, not only will the party not survive, but our country will not survive. It will no longer be a safe haven of liberty and justice for all. Blacks were the first group to get caught up in this lie of the left and became the first casualties in these three cultural wars, resulted in this dyslexic dependency that we see on Democrats today. For the last 50 years, the African American community has been convinced to put liberal policies and politicians above all their other concerns, 
above their faith, above their family, above their freedom, all in exchange for this so-called social justice. And today, they're paying a great price. And so is our nation. Let's remember, I've got to remind some, but let's remember the civil rights movement was a movement of morality. It was a moral movement that wanted to remove the barriers of government so that blacks could live free according to the Constitution. You look into almost every speech that Dr. King said. He is talking about our founding documents. You wouldn't know that if you went to his memorial in Washington, D.C. today. And in fact, they even forgot he was a preacher. You would think that he was a community organizer <laughs> against the Vietnam War. Now, this was a moral movement. The civil rights generation of the 50s wanted repentance and revival. But this social justice movement of today, no, they want revenge and redistribution. The first war that these progressives started against our culture was this war on religion. It weakened our public institutions, and it opened this door to this culture of corruption. We heard a lot about it on the panels over the last couple of days. The NSA, the TSA, the IRS, the, I mean, the list is long. When your congressmen, the rule makers, are polling at 11%, something's seriously gone wrong. They've scrubbed our schools of all reference to God. That's one of the things that has gone wrong. In 1962, the Supreme Court struck down state-sponsored school prayer. In 1963, the court ruled that you can't read a Bible or recite the Lord's Prayer. You know, people want to know, well, what is the significance of that? Well, the founders said you can't have a free people if you don't have a moral people. If you don't have a moral people, I mean, you can't have a moral people if you don't have a religious people. They didn't want a state-sponsored religion, but boy, I tell you, we got our law in a Judeo-Christian ethic. Because if you don't know the boundaries in society, the boundaries over life, you won't know how to live. We're seeing it now. And it's, it's fascinated me that in every discipline in our existence, we know that there are rules to govern those disciplines. There are rules to medicine and math. There are rules to, to engineer. I'm glad there are rules to engineering because I'm wondering how in the world they got that little thing up that mountain. <laughs> or the airplane we have to take tomorrow. There are rules to every discipline. You know, I'm, you know, there's been a lot of talk about doctors. I used to not like the doctors. The only reason I like doctors today is because I've always been for the underdog and, you know, so I have doctors are on my list and Wall Street bankers and hedge fund managers and that list is getting pretty long now that these folks are in Washington. But I, I, I couldn't understand doctors. I mean, the first thing you walk into their office and there's a scale. I mean, what's up with that? That is like, that is like a tool of intimidation. And in fact, when the doctor said, yeah, they, they come to our office 25 times in a year, I'm like, who would go to a doctor's office 25 times in a year? But I had to go to the doctor because my, when my knee turned 50 about seven, eight years ago, and I needed to go to the doctor. So I went on in there, and of course, first thing it did was make me look at the, get on that little scale, then go into a room, take off all your clothes, so then they can come over and really tell you how to eat, how to live, what to do. So of course, first thing you did was looked at my high heel shoes, and I'm like, uh, don't even go there, doctor. There are rules to, met, uh, to fashion as well. So I'm not even gonna go into why you think I should take off my high heel shoes. But when he mentioned that every now and then when a knee turns 50, you went, women your age, you may need surgery. All of a sudden, I want to know, did he know the rules to medicine? I did not want to hear that that degree on the wall was printed off at FedEx Kinko or bought on eBay. I want to know, did you go to school and learn the rules to surgery? Every discipline, we know there are rules to govern those disciplines. But when it came, comes to life, oh, no, people can figure it out on their own. No, they can't figure it out on their own. They look outside and see what everybody else is doing. And what do we see now when we look outside? We see pop culture. We see moral relativism. We see secular humanism. I get us all the time, especially the people that are, just read me. I'm syndicated columnists. They'll come out because they see me in the little box in their paper, and they come and say, oh, you're so much cuter in person. I say, well, thank you. And, you know, then, or the foxaholics, man, they come out, and they try that line, too. You're so much cuter in person. They're like, yeah, right, all that makeup they put on us. Uh -uh, I know that one's not true, especially when I do Varney in the morning. I have to go immediately to my apartment in D.C. and get that makeup off because I don't want people to think I reverted to my old life, and I was just kind of <laughs> getting in from the night before. But they, do, they see me doing these, or my Cure supporters, I'm running a think tank today, and they say, how in the world could you have had that pass and be here today? It's because it's easy to get lost. And there are a lot of people that are lost as a result of the first war that liberals declared 50 years ago. The second war that the progressives declared was this war on marriage. They want to talk about a war on women? No, you declared a war on marriage, and it weakened women, and it opened a door to this whole culture of meaninglessness. 
The feminist movement is nothing more than a promotion of monism, which is the elimination of gender binary. Conjugal marriage is a capstone for all humanity, a creation of the creator of heaven and earth himself. And now look at us as a result of their war on marriage. Homosexuality is now dividing us and bringing hostility into the public square. The answer to that is that all sexual behavior is adult behavior. Keep it private. <laughs> Abortion now is deeply hurt to us. 56 million dead in 40 years should give us all great pause. And we finally got to look into one of their so-called safe, legal, rare clinics with Gosnell up in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, where the plumber would no longer come to the facility because he said there were so many body parts in the sinks and the toilets that he just couldn't move fast enough. Or the freezer where the staffers had to put their food next to body parts of baskets and uh, bags and bags of the elimination of what God called his reward. In 1960, 75% of American adults were married compared to around 50% today. In 1960, 45% of ad young adults between 18 and 24 were married compared to just 9% today. I'm going to say that one again because this, this is a challenge for us. It's not only a challenge in our moral stability and well-being, but it's a challenge for us in many other areas, including housing, when you have singles living outside of the marriage um, uh, institution. In 60, 45% of young adults between 18 and 24 were married, and only 9% are married today. You know, it'd be one thing if they all just adopted this idea of sexual abstinence until they decided they were going to get married and they were just kind of living that way. Uh-huh, right. Now, they're sexually active, but without marriage. So in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was president, 18% of births were outside of marriage, compared to 43% today. 1.7 million in 2011 alone. Blacks, this social experiment of the 60s, you want to see what they've done to all communities? Blacks are their test case. And what we've seen happen to this community is now spreading all over the society. We thought during welfare reform, which I was one of the chief consultants on, that we were going to kind of contain this cancer and try to remove it so that people could live healthy. No, it's spread now. And blacks from this 60s experiment went from 22% out of wedlock births to 72% today. Whites moved from 3% in the 60s to almost 30% today, 8% higher than where blacks were in the 60s, which is why you're starting to see all these little social pathologies out into the middle class and in the suburbs that we thought were only the practices in the ghetto. The Hispanics, there was no data in the 60s. They were not a political tool to be manipulated for gain and power. But we have data today, and their adequate birth rates are at 53%. In a Gallup poll done earlier this year, 71% of the respondents between 18 and 34 said having a baby outside of marriage is morally acceptable. Not, I don't know, I'm not want to think about it, maybe I could, no, acceptable. You know, the challenge is, especially for those that are more libertarian minded that think that morality doesn't matter. Well, according to Ron Haskins at the Brookings Institution, in 2009, the poverty rate for children in homes that had married parents was 11%. The poverty rate for children in homes headed by single moms during that same year was 44.3%, which leads to the third war that the progressives declared, the war on poverty. It weakened families, and it opened up a door to a culture of entitlements. The great societies had great cost. In just 50 years, blacks went from 70% of their children being raised in marital households to today, 70% of black children are raised in single-parent households. And I can almost guarantee you when the dust settles up in Ferguson and all the demagogues and political race hustlers go home, we're going to find out that the pathologies in this community are similar to the pathologies that we see in absolutely every single inner city and, urban com and, and rural community across this country 
where marriage has collapsed and childbearing has continued, where poor men are promiscuous men, and promiscuous men are dangerous men. In just 50 years, blacks went from land-owned and entrepreneurial Republicans to government-dependent, reckless living Democrats today. The 50-year legacy of moral relativism and secular statism in the black community, today 25% of African Americans wallow in poverty at the hand of the state, and another 23 work for the government. People want to know why blacks are Democrats? Two problems. Marriage has collapsed, and they work for the government. We start talking about limiting the size and scope of government, you start having lowest learner bureaucrats respond. Everybody knows D.C. is a black town. And most people know that the largest and most affluent black community in the country is right outside of Washington, D.C. They're bureaucrats. They work for the city, the county, the state, the feds. This liberalism gripped America's poor and minority community some 50 years ago and locked three generations in economic stagnation and government dependency. And today, moral relativism and government dependency is choking our entire country. Means-tested federal welfare programs alone are at $800 billion annually. Now, I didn't get into all of the sessions, so I don't know if these facts that I'm getting ready to tell you, these numbers have already been told, but they bear repeating even if they have, because we're in trouble. We can't go on like this anymore. In the first three years of the Barack Obama administration, spending on these means-tested programs increased almost $150 billion, 31%. Today, 53% of all births in this country are paid for by Medicaid. 53% of all births. You don't think marriage matters? You don't think birth inside of marriage matters to the discussions we're having about our economic well-being? Well Medicaid also pays the bill for 60% of all long-term nursing home care. And now Barack Obama's getting ready to dump another 20 million in individuals on this 60 million already covered by Medicaid. Fact of the matter is the federal government now takes 25% of our economy. In 1980, 20% of Americans got more from government than they put in. Today, 60% of Americans get more from government than they put in. Okay, how are we going to do this, guys? How are we going to build a nation of free and prosperous people if we have a nation of irresponsible and government-dependent people? What we've seen in the black community is spilling out into the rest of this country, and if not for the work of Steamboat Institute and many others that you heard on panels, some of my friends that I've seen in the room from, from Frank Gaffney trying to help us understand and sort through all that's happening international as the world is unraveling to Steve Moore. To, to, to Grace Marie, these are warriors in Washington that are trying to make a difference in the space that we've been giving so that we can redeem ourselves and move ourselves to the right track to get closer to freedom and the ideals that the founders had in mind. The glaring truth underlying our, underlying our economic collapse is that liberalism doesn't work. Uncle Sam's plantation didn't work for blacks and it is not going to work for the middle class. According to Paul Ryan, Congressional Budget Chairman, entitlement reforms are vital. Over the next 10 years, he says, the Congressional Budget Office predicts discretionary spending, that is everything except entitlement programs and debt payment, will grow by $202 billion, or roughly 17%. This is on top of what we heard last night about where we are and how long it will take for us to pay back the $18 trillion that we are already in debt. But he said, meanwhile, mandatory spending, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, it will grow by 1.6 trillion, or roughly 79%. Out of control debt, enslavement to government, and broken families is just not a formula for a healthy country. The good news is we can change. Seems depressing every time I go over these numbers, it's like, this is depressing, but the good news is we can change. The good news is that every part of our country that's untouched by government is going great. The good news is ideas like what we just heard. I want to get up in this doctor's program and say, look, not only do I want you to come to our forum uh, and, and talk to our room that looks like this, but a little bit different in ethnicity because they're uh, pastors from urban communities all across this country. 
But these ideas of freedom, I was thinking about the health care sharing and how they got themselves exempted out of Obamacare before it happened. They hired a lobbyist. All this energy that says, oh, we hate lobbyists. Are you serious? They haven't come after you yet because if you're, I mean, even Starbucks has a lobbyist now. McDonald's has a lobbyist. McDonald's has a lobbyist because of food stamps. Because when we're doing changes in the farm bill, it's not the food stamp recipient showing up in Washington. It's J.P. Morgan and Walmart. That EBT card has put 800,000 businesses on food stamps. And McDonald's wants to know through their lobbyists how come they can't get one. They, are, they, they sell food. How does Walmart get to get it and they can't? How come Trader Joe has a swipe and they can't? We're in trouble, guys. But everything that's untouched is, is going great. I mean, look at this iPad. My little two-year-old granddaughter is teaching me new things every time I see her. I mean, she can find Mickey in a minute, and she can destroy stuff that I put on there, too, that she thinks I don't need, even though she can't talk. <laughs> American innovation and productivity where people are still free is just incredibly fantastic. And in fact, I'm working with some legislators down in, um, in Oklahoma to get ahead of uh, Paul Ryan's new idea to let's do a huge block grant and let the states decide how they want to move people off of dependency. So we're trying to build out pilot programs now. And I told him, I said, I was just jokingly saying, but you better be careful because I can tell you one thing that's going to happen. You're going to see a whole lot of tickets, one-way tickets on the Greyhound bus straight up to North Dakota because they're paying people 20 bucks an hour to work at McDonald's. <laughs> we need to disperse this stuff so people can live free. And we know when people are free that they know how to move around. We saw it in the last census data. To where people were leaving these blue states, going to these red states in droves. It's one of the reasons I spend a lot of time in Georgia right now, because they turned it purple. Because they don't understand. They, you left Detroit, you left Philadelphia, you left uh, 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 other areas of the north to go south. Well, you have to understand some fundamentals about why the south works so well. Their right to carry and their right to work, and we want to keep it that way. <laughs> don't, don't bring your... Don't bring your blue city values around us. Liberalism doesn't work. So where we have freedom, we have hope. But where there are serious challenges, there are serious work to be done. And getting a message of freedom and personal responsibility in our hard-hit communities is, is number one, in my opinion. Number one for anyone that believes in traditional values or limited government or free markets or even American exceptionalism and is involved in these, in these foreign policy issues. The steps out of poverty are not rocket science, but people have to be free to take them. We're hearing questions yet again in Ferguson. People are looking for answers. Why does this keep happening? And we get the same voices, the same attention. We already know what the right's going to say. We already know what the left is going to say. Someone needs to interject truth that they can comprehend so that they can understand why things are so broken in such a free and, and prosperous society. It's insulting that liberals keep pretending they care about the poor, yet they stand in the way of every idea that will help them. School choice vouchers and personal retirement accounts. How dare them keep saying that school choice vouchers are for the wealthy? The wealthy don't need vouchers. The wealthy are rich. They, they can buy the whole building and put their name on it and then send Johnny there and hire a teacher for him. Are you serious? The vouchers are for the poor. Money needs to follow people to schools. I don't even think about these folks are so broken, their families are so broken. The first lesson their two-year-olds learn is that commitment is not important. And then they look outside and see what one philosopher called the tragedy of the commons. No one owns it, so no one takes care of it. And then we send them to these cesspools we call schools, the only place we as society get them full time. And we want to trap them in a government-controlled, union-dictated environment? No, we want money to follow them to schools where men wear collars and have sticks in their hand and a Bible in the other that tells them, I know you can learn. <laughs> I have great confidence in you. I remember when I was, when my little grandson, he's eight years old now, but when he was about three years old, he came to my, he, well, his parents wanted him to come to my house. And he's like, I don't want to go to grandmommy's house. And he goes, she doesn't have anyone there for me to play with. And I'm like, honey, I'll play with you. I'll take you to the nail shop. Come on, we can go. We can go. We go hang out at Fashion Island or something. So he gets in the car. We get on down there, and then he's sitting there and he's looking around. He's like, Grandma, me, you don't have a dad, dad. I'm like, what do you mean I don't have a dad, dad? What does that mean? But at that point, he was calling his dad, dad, dad. He said, um, 
mama has a dada and you're alone. At two years old, they know. These liberals can keep going in these schools trying to convince us that there's nothing special about having a mom and a dad if they want to, but at two years old, they know that there's something missing. And then we end up with the situations that we have right now. They need personal retirement accounts. School choice and personal retirement accounts are paths to economic prosperity and independence. I hear it there in the Social Security debates. I've been in Social Security debates for a long time. And let me know, I'm almost finished, but I don't want to take too much time. I'm fine. Because I, want, I get one shot to let y'all know this. I was working in Social Security forum. I was even on an advisory committee with the, with the Cato Institute because they were the ones most adamant about making sure that people could put their money in an account that they own, that they can transfer, that they can get a decent return on. And what do we hear from the left? Oh, come on, that's for the wealthy. Maybe the wealthy doesn't retire off Social Security. No, the scripture says a good man leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. And the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And the very next scripture says, there's a lot of food in the fallow ground of the poor, but there's an injustice in the land. Yeah, that injustice is forcing the poor, the only little bit they have, to take 6.2% out of their check, force their employer to take 6.2% to put in a little black hole that they do not own. They cannot transfer, and they get a horrible rate of return. The poor more than anyone need help to get their children out of broken schools from under broken health care policy, broken housing policy, broken retirement policy, and broken welfare policy. And we need leaders that have the courage and the confidence to get this work done. This election, this November, is critical because we cannot go on like this as a country. And I've had to tell Tea Party groups all across this country, no, this is not the time to say we're staying home because we didn't get our candidate. We'll begin that debate the day after the election. And you can come knocking on the doors of those that you think are Republican in name only to get this work done. Because the liberals for too long have tried to speak on behalf of what some call the help, yet they're the most cruel offenders of the servants and their posterity. And in fact, as one writer said, the poor to them are simply or not like the Republicans said, simply takers, but worse, the poor are acceptors, beggars, dependent peasants, and breeding minorities that should be loyal to Democrats for every left-wing, pro-birth control, and pro-dependency molded crumb forced to them in the name of social justice. Oh no, the poor, that's who we have to focus on right now because they're draining us, and they're draining their own human capital, their own human spirit, listening to the lies of the left. They more than anyone need to understand the nature of money, the principles of capitalism, and compound interest. And even why our money says e pluribus unum. Many become one. All across this country, all they've heard is multiculturalism and diversity. We are just totally overwhelmed by liberalism. And they've got to be taught that theft is wrong, economic envy, social justice, redistribution of wealth is inconsistent and a violation of the scripture. It's not consistent with the founding principles of freedom and personal responsibility, and it is a violation of the Tenth Commandment that says, do not covet. Socialism is rooted in covetousness. Somebody has something somebody else doesn't have, so now we go hire politicians to take it from them? Now we violated two commandments, because the Eighth Commandment says, don't steal. And it is theft. For anyone who says it's not stealing, it's theft. Because the IRS is not writing letters saying, how would you like to benevolently give to this poverty program so Star Parker can ruin her life? No, the IRS is writing a letter saying, if you do not send this money to us, we will take you to jail and we have a gun. And right now I'm telling you, blacks and other low-wage workers in America only hear from liberals. Left-wing organizations get hundreds of millions in funding from left-wing foundation and unprincipled American corporations to pump left-wing lies into these communities. And our country won't survive if this work isn't done. Folks who care about the future of our great country that we're losing need to finally start making the investments it's going to take to get the truth into these communities. Because otherwise, it's just not going to happen. We are not going to be able to get what needs to be done to reverse these trends so that we can move on to health and rebuild our great country. When Reagan was elected, 88% of the electorate was white. In 2008, 74% of the electorate was white. In 2012, Barack Obama was re-elected to the presidency with only 39% of the white vote. 
it, it just, it, it's over, guys, unless we get serious about what has happened and the demographic shifts and how, you know, as we were talking about earlier, being a, a room full of people that are the half of the country that understand strength and what is broken down and wondering what about this other half? When you think about the fish that didn't know there was water until he starts seeing the sand, that's the greater America, that's middle America. Those are the ones that are in this room and the ones that are saying, wait a minute, we have to reverse these trends. But the other half of America never left the sand. They don't even know there's water. They've never been free. Blacks in particular moved from slavery to Jim Crow, from Jim Crow to a welfare state. They don't even know what freedom means. When we talk about a, a, your private doctor, I mean, I even grew up in a military family. We never had a private doctor. Half the country, by the time of Barack Obamacare even came to the table, was already getting their health care from government. And our youth, they have to understand some things, too. They have to understand that there are eternal truths, boundaries that should not be crossed, boundaries set in our Constitution so that our country would be free, boundaries that our framers themselves had to debate they were forced to debate more than 80 years regarding slavery because the freedom and the ideals of personal liberty hmm, conflicted with the very law of the very land that they themselves established. And we're no longer free when a politician gets to define truth. Now, I might make a lot of libertarians uneasy in the room about this, but I'm telling you there's nowhere in the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or the Bible that a politician has a right to force free people to pay for the lifestyles and choices of other free people. Not their housing, not their health care, not their food, not their child care, not their retirement, not their habits, and certainly not their sex life. Not their Viagra. <laughs> not their condoms, not their birth control devices, and certainly not their abortions. That's why my organization, Urban Cure, is working in the mainstream media. It's why we're working in social policy reform on Capitol Hill. It's why we're working with a select group of urban pastors all across this country. And it's why I'm thankful for opportunities to speak to people like yourselves, to encourage you to do something, anything, to fight for the future of our great country, to help move our nation from a nation of entitlement to a nation of empowerment. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, stop it. Thank you. Oh, will you stop? Oh, my, oh yeah, that's my friend. Should have known it was you. <laughs> they said I have, thank you, Frank. They said I have a few moments to answer a few questions. So I will do that if I can. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. When I lived in New York, I had a lot of black friends. I live in Colorado now. I don't think I know any black people. What can I do to help the situation and reverse this new slavery, as I call it, without being, being called politically incorrect? Where do you live in Colorado? Greeley. We don't have too many blacks there. We have Hispanics, but not too many blacks. Uh, I think it snows there. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, uh, it does. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I know, we're not supposed to be like politically incorrect when it comes to racial differences, but there are some. Sunday morning is one. And it's not that we deliberately say, well, like Bill Clinton tried to, Sunday morning is the most integrated, uh, segregated hour in America. It's like, you know, actually, that's a lie. Sunday morning is the most integrated hour in the world. Because <laughs> it's the only time that everybody from all ethnicities, all backgrounds, of, eh, join with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven to sing one song. But um, they're all differences. Uh, one is who has the time clock. Because uh, you go to church too late in the white community, man, you miss the sermon. Uh, and uh, you go to black church, you better be ready to stay all day. Uh, and uh, one of the ladies earlier and I were talking about the difference between the green box and the red box. That's another one. And then um, I was asked earlier, y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you non-smokers know what I'm talking might not know what I'm talking about. And I don't smoke anymore, but uh, we were just sharing how back in the day, the green box was most important to black people, that red box, I pass. I knew I didn't really have a habit because I wasn't going anywhere near a marble. But, um, but then also the music thing, you know, we all know that that's a difference. Um, I won't be at the concert tonight. But uh, uh, 
but to your question, more seriously, New York is just much more diverse. So yeah, you could perhaps have a lot of black friends. But one of the challenges that I think you're alluding to is that we have become so much more racially polarized lately, and our friendships are withering away. It's becoming much more complicated uh, because where our lives touch uh, are beyond just the, the the political or should be. They're in the social arena as well. But these issues have been so politicized, especially with this president, that it's very difficult to get to other places where our lives touch. Um, we're starting to see the world very differently, and it's almost well, it's becoming much more predictable that any time we have any situation that involves a white or black encounter, um, that, that the sides lock in their absolute positions now, and there's no middle ground or discussion. It is unfortunate. How do you reach this down into these communities? What we're doing is my organization as a strategy, we work with the pastors themselves. Uh, out of the 45,000 black churches in the country, not all of them are Jeremiah, right? Not all of them are the ones you're seeing in Washington, I mean in, um, in, in, in um, Ferguson. Uh, in fact, in our assessment and through our data, we found that 10% are on our side. So that's 4,500, we wanna know who they are. Uh, we're in this desperate, pursuit for them is very hard because these are the ones that have told pollsters for the last uh, 25 years that they are evangelical and conservative. They are the ones that do not encourage their uh, congregants to even go into the political process because there are not many choices uh, in the communities that they represent because Republicans for years don't even bother to run anyone in these communities. Uh, but they are on our side on many of the social issues and some of the economic issues, so we find uh, places to work there. Uh, that might be something you'd want to team up with. And one area that they have trouble in, in a local, on a local level, and I'm pretty sure down in Denver you're going to find this, is in educating their children, finding space for uh, uh, building out capacity and then fighting for school choice, finding out if there's in your state uh, a challenges. We know in Oklahoma, I just left there, they have Blaine Amendment. Down in Alabama, we're trying to get Selma some vouchers. These people are desperate. Uh, when I, I just heard some numbers about just what's happened in charter school. There are over a million parents with their children waiting on lists just to get in charters. These folks are desperate. When we passed school choice in Washington, D.C. through the scholarship program that Barack Obama tried to take away, there were only 1,700 of those scholarships for $7,500 a piece, and uh, it's 1,700. It was just a very, very small sampling. So what they did was had to, okay, now we finally got it. How do you put, select the 1,700 people? So they had to do a lottery, and they picked the worst of the worst, the poorest of the poor. You had to be at risk. You had to be in a school failing, and you had to be failing in that school. And they got 30,000 applications. And then prior to that, years ago, when we were testing out because it, the venom of the left to keep these kids just enslaved to their um, government schools uh, was so heavy, we needed some private models. So Ted Forsman and John Walton, got rest both of their souls, came up with a model for, um, for scholarships, if you will, or vouchers, uh, and they used the same uh, means test, that you had to be the poorest of the poor in the most at-risk environment, you had to be um, failing in your school, you had to be in a failing school. They had 30,000 of these uh, opportunities available, and they got 1.3 million applications. So poor parents are desperate, so if you want a place to go in uh, to begin the dialogue, then I would encourage you to start at school choice and educational options. Education uh, and the right framework, uh, which means, a, uh, in, a, it, in my opinion, an environment that offers a, a, a Christian worldview uh, is where we're going to be able to reverse these trends. Not only will they get quality information so that economically they will be stable, but they will also get a moral framework so that they can understand that, um, you know, right choices, that they have an obligation to their neighbor to be self-sufficient and to be responsible with the choices that they make. Yeah. Yes. Star, a few years ago I was having a uh, conversation with a token liberal friend of mine and I'll never forget his comment when we got talking about the minority community. He said, Gary, we have to take care of these people. Mm. And I don't think it even occurred to him what an incredible condescending remark that was. And then when George W., somebody gave him this line, I'm sure, and I thought it was one of the greatest lines to come about in the last few decades about the soft bigotry of low expectations. Right. I just right. wondered if you want to well, attack that. You know, it, someone said the other day, I think it was Father Sirico mentioned how um, y y you hope that there's at least something 
good in the destruction that we've allowed to create uh, in our most impoverished communities. In fact, who wrote mo best on this subject, uh, in my opinion, of, if, of recent note, is um, George Gilder when he did Men in Marriage. And he talked often about uh, the role of father, the role of marriage in family to build a healthy society. The black community was already very vulnerable coming out of slavery, uh, more so than even Jim Crow. Uh, and so when they began the discussion about how to build, how to help transition the former four million uh, enslaved into a healthier society, we saw a couple of things occur. We not only saw big government get in the way uh, and begin to uh, experiment, but we also started seeing the left uh, undermine through their secular worldview of whether marriage has a role in, uh, and religion, marriage and religion has a role in this. Uh, and it was a very vulnerable community. And so people like, um, uh, then he was Labor Secretary, Daniel Monaghan said, wait a minute, let's not experiment this way because you will collapse this community. But it's not new that some really wonder, uh, can this community live free? Uh, when you think about the destruction that occurred, and even the, the, the societies that they came out of, you know, the, in my opinion, the biblical worldview, the Judeo-Christian ethic is what civilized us as a, as a world, as, any, as a humanity. Uh, and so, yes, was there social chaos of those in the beginning coming out of African countries at that time to come to America? The answer would be yes. But when uh, confronted with the same question during that time, Frederick Douglass said, do nothing with the Negro. Because they were saying, well, what do we do then? How do we, you got all these folks, you have four million people who are accustomed to living off plantation, that, the, that someone else is taking care of their whole interest. Can they really live free? Uh, he asked them to do nothing, make sure that you give them the opportunity. And then he started speaking to the former slave to say, look, if you fail, you fail. But you want to at least have the opportunity to fail. And then the social engineers started getting involved, those of that philosophy that really believe that this part of mankind can't live free. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm one that wants to, our people to take great risks. I believe that, um, that in great risk there's great reward. And I wish that we had been given more opportunity at that time to see where we would be today had no one put up these new barriers uh, of government to, to stop our progress. Uh, when I look at some of uh, my own family, I mean, my granddad was one generation out of slavery, and he believed as an edict, I never met the man, but he believed, and the philosophy was clear in our family early on, before the social engineering of the 60s, that you needed two things to stay free, property and a gun. And he bought up a lot of property that we never sold in, the, in South Carolina today. Uh, it's in, circled now with all these golfing communities, and so I was watching very closely the decision at the Supreme Court on eminent domain, and as soon as it ruled against um, the private property owner, I made a personal phone call to then Governor Mark Sanford, who was a friend, and said, uh, what you guys doing down there in South Carolina? Because I got interest up there in that Greenville-Spartanburg area that I, uh, that I want to hope you know, to, to maintain. And of course, South Carolina, being one of our good red states, made sure that people uh, maintain that part of freedom. But yeah, I know, it, it can become offensive. And I think that, Gary, the, uh, no, my final point would be that these are the opportunities that others should look for with their friends, not to break down right and left and just listen to the same rhetoric with the same stories. Um, that we should start engaging them. You should start engaging your friends that are looking into this community saying what happened and bring them some truth. I've got a book coming out this uh, September uh, uh, that I did earlier this year called Blind Conceit. Okay, and what I'm looking at is how to beat the race politics of the left, 2014 and beyond. But it's a compilation of my columns that I've written for Scripps News Service over the last 10 years. And I'm hoping that in there, and what I was hoping to do with the book, is to give folks like yourself, conservative whites, the opportunity to engage not just other whites, but also the blacks that they meet with some information so that we can begin a new dialogue. We cannot keep saying every time there's a police shooting, well, look at black on black crime. 90% of all crime is against someone you knew. So of course there's more black on black crime, just like there's more white on white crime. It was just, it's in these situations where you don't know, where it's a stranger crime, that A, it is news. And frankly, on that particular question, this community has told pollsters for years that they are insecure in their person and their property on a local level. Okay, now whether perceived or real, they have told posters that we do not feel secure in our person and our property on a local level.
put yourselves in that shoe and then wonder how do we reduce the size and scope of government if on a local level you do not have those constitutional prote protections. So I think we should take this seriously and begin dialogue where people say they are. The same way in a family, you know, you look at marital situations right before they go in divorce, the wife has been telling them for years, you're not paying enough attention to the home. Where he's telling, hey, I go to work every day. But you're not paying attention to the home. But I go to work every day. If she perceives that he's not paying enough attention at home, whether he's going to work every day and she's wearing a $40,000 diamond from Tiffany's, he could end up with half his assets gone because she's got another man now. So we have to be conscious and mindful of what people say they're feeling when we begin these dialogues uh, to save our country. Wonderful talk, Star. God bless you. You should be giving the uh, Republican National Convention speech. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. You know, my, my question touches on something you said just a few minutes ago about the, the, the black family and, and how that has, has been a, a major problem over the last few decades. And people like Bill Cosby has spoken out uh, about that very issue. And when he speaks out, the race hustlers and everybody else come out and Boy, they, they just do. cut they, they just cut him a new one. They do. And um, and that's a big problem. It it, it really um, it dissuades others right. from from coming out and, right. and saying what needs to be said. What's the solution? Well, it is an old strategy. You're right. In fact, if you remember during slavery, uh, when one would run away. Uh, the, and they got caught is one of the reasons behind the Fugitive Slave Act was to get everybody to stop pulling these folks out. Uh, but when they would go back, the slave owner would bring out all the other slaves and force them to watch him or his overseer strip the skin off of that slave so that nobody will try to run away. Uh, that's the same strategy of the same people. These were Democrats that were supporting slavery. These are Democrats that are using that same type of, um, you know, MO uh, to keep people enslaved. So when you look at people like just Jackson, Al Sharpton, and, and the list is long. We just see them quite often, but my goodness, it's almost every political and media personality, uh, African-American persuasion on the, on the left. They're just totally 100% left wing, and they're totally, uh, the academics, it's just, it's just it's incredible. I look at them as the overseers. They are making sure that not one escapes. So when you look at someone like a Bill Cosby, who spent his life, he's what we might call a traditional or classical um, liberal, uh, more like a libertarian today, uh, who's now looking after years of work, years after Civil Rights Act, years of, of, of being from that generation that was taught to work hard uh, to get ahead, to get education. He's looking now in his community and asking them a real hard question out loud, um, what's gone wrong and, and how are we going to fix this? But you're absolutely right, the overseers uh, were right there to snap him back. Unfortunately, there was not enough to rally him that he went back and then within six months had a book with a liberal uh, and is back on that liberal um, uh, philosophy or at least uh, saying, uh, saying it you know, from a public pulpit. But what we need to keep our eye on and this is what I keep my on and why we're building an underground with these pastors. People call me all the time, let me have the pastors. No, they're on an underground right now. They're in school. Is what we have to keep an eye on is what also happened when Bill Cosby made his comments a few years back. It, the black elite in their traditional response, but the lines were wrapping around buildings, thousands of these people that are entrapped in that worldview were waiting hours to hear him. That's where we should keep our eye, making sure that they get that information and thank God for the internet. It is his invention, it is not Al Gore, because if it was Al Gore, it would be taxed by now. It is not Al Gore, it was God. He gave us a way to get information to the masses in a very short period of time. So what our strategy has to be is to start utilizing, gathering more information, which is why this is important, simplifying it like what we saw in that one little brochure and then getting it to the people that it matters to most. Remembering and keep in mind that this is still a free country. We still have elections. It's like President Garfield said. He said, you don't need term limits. We gave you term limits. They're called elections. And if you have, taught, if you have recklessness and, uh, and, and, um, and corruption in government, it's because you tolerated it. 
And we the people still get to decide because we the people still get to go into the voting booth and we the people still get to choose our leadership. So we have to start taking that seriously and then pushing hard at the same time into these hard hit communities. Yes, the voices get uh, pulled back, but we have new places to put those voices. We're, my organization itself, we're launching our own television show. We're trying to buy time. There's a network out right now called Word Network. It's a, um, cable time has fallen in half because of, um, because of the internet, but yet people still sit down and watch TV. The numbers have not fallen. They're doing, transitioning the same way in the television industry that the radio did when television showed up. And so time has fallen apart right now. And there's this network. It's 95% black Christian audience. You guys may have never even heard of it. It's called Word. But Jesse Jackson has a show every Saturday morning uh, for an hour. So my group has been in a fundraising campaign to buy that hour right before his show or right after. Uh, people, uh, we're, uh, everyone's telling me I should buy the hour before him, though, because by the time he finishes, everybody be gone or sleep. But I'm, you know, and I can't decide, okay, if we go on before him and we're real hyper, and then he comes on, they'll just say, oh, that's so old school. Or, um, or do we go on after and try to explain? So we're probably going to try to shoot for that hour before. Uh, but yes, there, you're right. It, it's pitiful. Every time, I mean, like Paul Ryan right now, he has and is on book tour to do basically Welfare Reform Part 2. Because when we did Welfare Reform, uh, we started seeing the numbers drop. We never got to the hard hit communities, but when you just put a little parameters, we knew 65% of that caseload had a high school diploma, one child, work experience. They just needed a nudge. But then we had to get to the hard places. We go to get to the hard place. George W. Bush comes to Washington. Power changed hands, but stayed in Washington. Uh, and then he brought that faith-based initiative to put the churches on welfare. It's like, we're trying to move women off welfare, and now you're going to put the churches on? So that was like eight years of just kind of sitting there. So now Paul Ryan is saying, wait, we need to get back to the business. This is a quarter of our budget. If we're going to reduce the size and scope of government, we can't go around the, the, this welfare state. Uh, we're going to have to go into it, in all of it, not just the food stamps, but the child care and the WIC. And the, and, the, and the housing is where I really think we, have in, we can make inroads, because if you disperse it, uh, you all of a sudden start seeing liberalism collapse. But he wants to now block to the states. He's saying, and they're already after him. He hasn't even gotten the idea fully out of his mouth, and there's just like 100 reasons it can't work, including people at Brookings. It's like, come on, you guys are supposed to be center, not left. But that's for another discussion, especially since they're taping. But um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I mentioned Bill Cosme in my book. And you're right. It's, it's tragic that any and every voice. And ben, ben Carson. Ben Carson has been a hero in black homes for generations. There, I, I can, there's probably not a black family in this country that except our really hard hit poor um, and, and, and welfare uh, case, um, we call them the intensive cares, that doesn't have their 12 year olds. When it's like a rite of passage at 12 that you had to read Gifted Hands. It was just, that's what we did. That's what all we different generations. You know, he just came to the national, but um, I mean, his picture's next to Martin Luther King Jr., Jesus, and, and, and Snoop Dogg in most homes, you know? <laughs> but, um, oh, I know, I forgot. And Kennedy. Kennedy's on, these, in, on the wall, too. They always have the picture of Jesus, Martin Luther King, and, and Kennedy. And then their newest hero, which now is probably Beyonce or somebody like that. But, but he's been, and the minute he gets, in the minute he disciplines the president on a very fine point about secularism and taking a sixth of this economy and, 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 and try to sell it off on the people that are already living under this horror of government dependency when it comes to uh, health care and, and, and health services. And now look, he's in the doghouse. But and I, when I, one time I had opportunity to do that show, The View, one time. No, people, Star Jones had left. Whoopi wasn't there yet. They're politically correct, so they had to have a black. They were desperate for a black. So John Stossel, called, he was at ABC then, and he's like, Michael Moore is going to be on. And he had just brought out that movie, Sicko. And um, he wouldn't debate anyone, so I had to do 45 minutes of Joy Behar and Barbara Walters uh, just to get to Michael Moore. You know, if I get into heaven, when I get into heaven, I'm, after I do all my repentance, I'm going to ask for one little star for that 45 minutes. <laughs> but the reason I'm bringing it up now is because I only wanted to ask Michael Moore one question. Why did he go to Cuba and Canada to see socialized medicine? He could have gone to Compton or Camden or any inner city in this country and see what happens when government controls health care. We don't have to do much 
to hone our ideas. What we are is all R&D. We need to develop out a marketing department to sell our ideas. Thank you.